for you. Uh, so uh, I'm going to hand it over to Mike and Kent. Uh, I'm going to talk about some cloud security at scale. Cool. Give it up. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a one-track conference. We didn't have too many other options. But, uh, <laughs> and I just wanted to say really quick, for the record, we didn't intend to be wearing a uniform. It just happened. So yeah. here we are. We're on the same wavelength today. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. This is Cloud Security at Scale. So why listen to us? So I'm, uh, I'm Mike McCabe. Um, I'm a security consultant, uh, mostly application security and cloud security. Um, I've been in the industry for about 10 years, and I've worked both as a consultant and internally doing uh, cloud security and application security. Uh, I'm Ken Toller, uh, and I've I'm also been in, for, in this industry for about 10 years. Uh, and I'm back in the consulting world now, but I spent four to five years basically on the blue side, working corporate, and this is how I spent most of my days. Um, trying to do security in, in an organization, a finance organization. Yeah. So what are we talking about today? So uh, Ken and I have some similar experiences and you know, we've worked different places, but we got to talking about the things we've seen in organizations and as doing consulting for organizations. And we found some similarities. Um, and so we kind of broke this talk down to three financials that we uh, either worked with as a consultant or worked with internally. Um, and there's a lot of common themes and some interesting kind of insights we had about this. So we wanted to share these stories with everyone. So uh, this has a Simpsons theme. These are all real companies, but the names have been changed to protect the innocent and not so innocent. Um, so Lisa's Lending, Bart's Banking, and Homer's Hedge Fund. If you don't like the Simpsons, you should Sorry. <laughs> it's going to be a long talk. Yeah. Uh, so to start, Bart's Banking. So Bart's Banking is a really interesting uh, case study because they're a large financial, not super old, but you know, been around for 30 plus years. But they have uh, been in the cloud for five plus years from pretty early days in AWS. Um, so they have a lot of maturity, but they have a lot of complexity. Um, and I think one of the things, one of the things that I think about maturity when it comes to cloud security is not always the Netflix like super automated like we you know, have all these crazy tools. It's like some pretty basic things. So like everyone's familiar with OODA loop probably, um, but it's basic. Observe, orient on that observation, decide what you want to do, and then act. Um, and I think that's a baseline most people don't have when they go into cloud security. Um, and that's something Bart's banking did do. And that's impressive because they're across, you know, five plus years um, of experience, tons, 200 accounts, hundreds of apps, if not thousands, thousands of developers. Um, but what are their issues? Because not everything is great there. So when you start out in cloud security, um, or just using the cloud, uh, things are pretty basic. You have your typical three-tier architecture. Um, you know, nothing too complex, easy to reason about, relatively easy to secure. Um, but over time, that grows in complexity. Um, you know, you have more integrations. Uh, people moved into like a, you know, a large AWS account model, and then people started breaking it down into smaller accounts. Um, but all this interconnectivity and uh, complexity kind of crop up. Um, and then in the end, after you know, five plus years, this is, uh, I always imagine at any large company, there's like two people in a basement who know how everything works, and this is what they look like because <laughs> it's just so insane. Um, and that's the problem that Bart's making had too, was that you know, they, they grew organically and they grew over many years, and that complexity just you know, just grew a huge amount. Um, and they went all in on cloud, so everything had to be moved there, and it didn't matter, um, you know, if it was a good fit for cloud or not. So complexity, that's, that's the, you know, that's the key term with Bart's banking. So um, the big issue is inter interconnectivity, and that goes between, you know, different AWS accounts, different VPCs, on-prem to cloud access, um, and things like that. Uh, tracking data across those accounts, um, you know, uh, that's not always easy to do. People don't like to see lower environments, dev or sandbox environments is a place where you can't put production data, and that's a really big issue and something that they struggled with. Um, and, you know, we talk about cloud being infinitely scalable, but, you know, there are some soft and hard limits on the, you know, how you can scale. So customer managed policies in the AWS account, 1,500 by default. Um, it's amazing how many clients I've seen who hit this or go way over it, and they have to ask AWS to you know, raise the cap. So that's 1,500 policies for how people access the cloud or access resources that you have to somehow reason about. 
So that's, that's kind of what happens when you grow um, in the cloud and become more and more complex. And people, you know, going back to the architect, people really didn't know how things work. You could ask a security person, okay, what talks to what? And without them spending a lot of time digging into the network, they didn't really know how it worked. And architecture diagrams did not exist. So meanwhile, security, as I said, trying to uh, keep up with what's going on, and no offense to security people, I also work in security, but you know, I feel like this is the struggle we have. We're trying to keep up with what's going on, um, and at the same time putting out fires, because I feel like that's 70% of the job. You know, We're trying to be strategic, but we're putting out fires instead, and trying to enable without being insecure. And we have to do that through security services and automation, um, and you know, it's just difficult to balance those two things. So quick aside on data scientists, there's probably a couple people here. And first off, I respect data scientists. You all do things that I, you know, I, I don't know how to do, R and machine learning and everything like that. But data scientists like to take tons of data um, and apply some Python to it and create data loss. <laughs> so, uh, so, Thank you, thank you. It's all original right there, yeah. <laughs> um, so again, data scientists, they're trying to get their job done, but I found time and time again, data scientists were moving huge amounts of data around into the cloud, into lower environments without the controls to get their job done, but of course it turns into a huge liability. So Michael Jordan, great basketball player, makes some very nice shoes, uh, <laughs> but he's also a visionary when it came to cloud security. So I think this is, this is how you should approach cloud security. It's not you know, newfangled um, tools. It's not you know, just building crazy machine learning to fix everything. It comes down to very basic housekeeping. So you have your inventory. You know what's out there. You can detect what's going on in that inventory and those apps, those servers, databases, networks, all those kinds of things. You can alert on that, and then you can remediate. If you're to that point across hundreds of apps, or sorry, hundreds of accounts and thousands of apps, you're in a pretty good place when it comes to cloud security. So now Ken. Yeah. Um, so I mean, what you can kind of take away from that is even even in a mature organization, um, regulated financial services can be uh, a sort of a personal cloud hell. And we have Ned Flanders here to help us show us what that looks like. Um, so the thing about fintechs is that um, and, and financial services in general is that money matters to people. Um, nobody likes losing money or having their data breached or anything like that. So if something goes wrong, it can lead to some real damage. And we're talking about a bunch of legacy systems and regulation and all these things that make things complex. Uh, so I want to talk about um, an organization that uh, I worked in. Uh, names again changed to protect the innocent. And, uh, but it was a medium-sized organization with a startup culture, doing a lot of innovative things in finance, uh, hungry for new stuff, starting to get bound down by regulations and partnerships, you know, using a lot of SaaS integrations and starting out in the data center. So they were sort of um, at the beginning looking at, at cloud and, and what that might mean for the future, but it just wasn't ready for what they were doing. Um, had a great team of DevOps engineers and developers. So I don't want you to get the idea that this is like a super old organization, right? We're talking about 10 years, maybe. People really like to push the envelope and the desire is to really make something cool and new and, um, and, and change the industry. And DevSecOps or security and ops and, or whatever you want to call it, whatever your non-offensive word is, uh, is all about innovating and moving left and getting closer to design and integrating it you know, throughout the development pipeline. But in order to do that in finance, you have to move through these three major barriers that we've seen as common themes uh, in all of the organizations that we've worked in, uh, whether you're on the blue team, whether you're in it as consulting, and that's complexity, regulation, and legacy systems and process. And we talk about complexity in finance service, and we're not just talking about your company as like a small organization and all the things that you have to do, but if you're using a lot of integrations, uh, which in finance is, is not uncommon, um, you're bringing the baggage and the regulations from all those other companies as well, and they will push you. So if you wanna do a partnership with a big bank or something like that, they're gonna push you to meet their regulations. On top of that, there's a bunch of niche organizations that do like some small component of bank st statements or credit or account history or identity and asset verification and a bunch of smaller vendors that do subcomponents of those different practices. And you almost, it almost becomes like library management trying to manage those vendors and figure out where that goes. On the, on the larger side, those are the Equifaxes, the LexisNexis of the world. 
But you're also talking about some small players that do one component. You know, they operate in some ancient language or, or something like that, and you're trying to build this into your architecture. So if you start to use that to get into the market, it's really hard to move those into the cloud. Combine that with regulatory compliance for your particular business, whether that's PCI or SOX or SOC 2, adds more complexity in that regulation. And in the case of leases lending, <clears throat> that was FIPS 140 2 level 3. Do we have anybody familiar with that? One, two people. <laughs> level 3 is a complete nightmare. There's like some spy level stuff in there. You got two cards, you got to turn at the same time, put in a code, you know, change this, you know, all the physical tampering stuff. It's just, it's a real pain. And it's not part of any regulation that we had to meet for compliance, but what it was was something that a partner wanted us to do because they wanted to prepare for the future. And if we want to do business with them, you're going to have to meet that. So there's the only regulation there is that partner. In finance, you've also got languages like COBOL or mainframes. How many people have dealt with a mainframe password? Yeah, one, two people. You know that they're like eight characters. You can't use any special characters at eight character max. How do you put that in the cloud? <laughs> you know? So it, it's, it's these considerations that you have to make specific to finance, right? So it's like, where do we put these layers? How do we add on to that? So let's talk about layers. How many of you have seen this? Oh, I know people have seen this. This comes up in like every cloud meeting ever. Right? And, it's, and it's, it's kind of a problem because, you know, we, we sell this and we're like, we want you to move to the cloud and we, and we talk about, you don't, have, you don't have any responsibility. You know, it's like uh, it was talked about earlier, we want it all for free. Um, but what this is doing is really exposing uh, different layers of security to you and it's almost shoving everything into the application layer, your software defined networking, you know, it, the, the, your provider is providing these uh, different ways to interact with security. And all of it just adds to this confusion. And Homer's always confused. So I felt like this was great. There's a tire fire in the background. It seems like a lot of what we went through. So for leases lending, we had to sit down and think about how do we change, how do we eliminate this confusion? And for us, it was, we need to figure out what is important to this business, right? Let's secure that and secure it well. Let's prioritize on that. Um, let's make that secure, whether it's, and, and through compliance, we're saying, you know, we can achieve these goals as opposed to tack on more work for the organization. Stability was huge. It was like, how do we keep the lights on with the customer, make sure that they don't notice the transition, have it all running. Um, we have a limited team, we have limited time. We don't have people with this type of skill set, which brings us to resource management. Knowing what the teams know. People are new to the cloud. Where do we put our network engineers? How do we train them? Or who do we hire? Is it senior? Are we firing everybody? Like these are things that you have to think of from the, from the business perspective before you decide to move if you have any legacy organization. And the last one is back to that FIPS 140-2 level three and a common problem across all organizations that basically um, is an issue for all of your stack, which is that secret management. For us, it was de developers had all the secrets, right? They configured them in development, they configured them in staging, and maybe we had some control over prod, but how do we make, how do we make that uh, matter? So our approach was enabling. We're in a really unique position in security right now where we have the ability to enable the business. We're usually a cost center. We're usually telling you what to do that's gonna cost you money and how to protect your business from whatever it is. But now we have tools and the, the availability to, to enable the business. And so we had to focus on, on what that looked like. And that really came down to how do we reduce time, reduce money or budget, and reduce the overall effort of, the, of, of what we're doing in security. Um, when we talk about something like account management, some folks might say, oh, well, AM's got a, uh, or, you know, AWS has account management, or AWS has secrets management, or a AWS has key management. And then all of those uh, regulations and all those problems I've talked about before start to creep in. So we basically have to sell it as, we want better, easier account management, right? We want more secure, faster, auto-rotating secrets by, by moving to something that is, has cloud concepts at its core, like HashiCorp Vault, or if you are full AWS, SSM, or something like that. It allows you to say, we're gonna help our incident response team respond faster to this. If we have a, if we have a secret leak, we can rotate that thing so fast, you, you know, won't even notice, as opposed to going through all these manual processes. If we outsource authentication and move that into the cloud, then we don't have to handle it, right? Um, managing keys and almost all these can meet all these compliance concerns that we do. So how do we, as a security team, enable the business as opposed to become a cost center? And with that, I'll turn it back over to Mike to talk about um, Homer's hedge fund. 
Cool, thanks. Uh, so Homer's Hedge Fund, very different from Lisa's Lending or Bart's Bank, uh, which if you say those names five times fast, it's difficult. Um, so <laughs> it's a family. Yeah, they, uh, they are a much larger financial company, been around for close to 100 years. Um, a tech company, but you know, still has an old school mentality. And they kind of uh, wandered into the cloud accidentally. So people started using AWS, they put some apps there, they want to see you know, what advantages does this give me. Um, and they've only been in the cloud for about three years, uh, but they're kind of building things, building things up. Um, the issue is, you know, this wasn't a strategic decision like Lisa's lending or Bart's banking. No one said, all right, this, we're going all in on cloud, here's the strategy. This happened naturally, so they moved tons of stuff into the cloud without really thinking about how they're going to do this. Um, at the same time, they're going into multi-cloud, so you don't have one cloud to secure, you now have two, which is awesome. Um, and so they kind of wandered into the cloud, and they can't get back out. <laughs> That's credit to Ken for that one. But um, it's not that they want to get out of the cloud. They understand the, the strategic and technical advantages of it. It's more of they have to somehow fix the current cloud while also building a strategy for the future, which is very difficult to do. It's changing the tires while um, you know, driving the car on the highway. So some of the struggles they have is you know, they don't have the strategy built. They don't know, you know, they don't have it set how they do roles. They don't have it set how deployments um, you know, happen. So, in comparison to BART's banking, they don't have that inventory that BART's banking has. They don't have the basics even in place, vulnerability scanning, because if you have this very complex, weird, mesh, not sensical network layout, layout you can't really do vulnerability scanning even. Um, you know, reporting is still very basic. Tagging is a huge issue in AWS, and if you don't have tags in place, how do you say who has vulnerabilities? Um, you send a lot of emails, that's how you do it. Uh, tooling, you know, using off-the-shelf products, which are not bad, but still you're, you're stuck to the vendor's kind of ability to build things out. Um, and they don't have a multi-cloud strategy. And this is my dad joke of a hybrid cloud. <laughs> um, so they're still stuck, they're still stuck, you know, on-prem connecting to cloud, and that's a very difficult thing to do securely because on-prem is a tire fire. And if anyone says they don't have a flat network, they are lying to you. So. <laughs> But it's not all bad, so what are they doing to address this? So I think the, the term that I like is patterns. You, just, you build structured ways of doing things and you just repeat that over and over again. And you inform people of what that looks like. So if that's like, how do I move my app to the cloud based on its old on-prem model? Um, I mean, Ken talks about this quite a bit, but it's, you, know, you build those patterns for how you do something, you do it over and over again. App teams aren't special snowflakes. You know, they, a lot of them use the same technologies, same you know, stack architecture, all those kinds of things. So you have to build ways for people to do this, standardize it, document it, communicate it very well, and make it easy to, um, to access. Um, so standardizing access, figuring out how people access the cloud, so you have your, you know, if it's using Azure AD as your identity, or you have a traditional AD service, all those kinds of things. Um, and a centralized group that you know, is cross-cutting across the organization, building out um, st strategy and solutions. And some of the things, if you're not using these, you know, you're probably using AWS IAM, because you pretty much have to. But AWS organizations is a great way to organize you know, multiple accounts and, and put controls in place. Um, service catalog is a great way to force your developers to use what you want them to use and what's approved to be used. And that's a way that you know, this company has been kind of formalizing um, how they do things in the cloud. Um, so a quick word on multi-cloud. People think of multi-cloud, ex especially executives who go to a Gartner conference. Um, they say, you know, we're going to go multi-cloud so we don't have vendor lock-in. So when AWS, you know, jacks up their prices, we can just jump to Azure or GCP. No one's on GCP, but um, <coughs> but I think it's a I think it's a total pipe dream. Um, I don't think if you use Docker, or you use Kubernetes, you can just you know de you know deploy your app to three different clouds at once. I think there's some people who do this, and I think the amount of effort they put into making it work and try to secure it is, is just ludicrous. So I think you use multi-cloud in the sense of you utilize the strength of each of the clouds. So if you're a big Microsoft shop, Azure is great for those kinds of things. But if you're doing agile development, maybe you put that in AWS and you use different pieces. Um, so you utilize the strengths instead of trying to build a carbon copy of your AWS environment in your Azure environment. So a note on cloud compliance. So I'm pretty technical. At least I say that. Uh, Ken is 
you know, very technical. And we've been doing AppSec and cloud security for a long time, a lot of code review, a lot of dynamic testing, all those kinds of things. So compliance has always been the person who sends out an Excel spreadsheet with a macro on it that, you know, kills your computer because it's trying to calculate everything, just full of vulnerabilities to say, yeah, here, fix these things. Um, but in the cloud, I think compliance is very different because we have this control plane that tells us everything we have out there, the status of it, for the most part, you know, encryption, access, all those kinds of things. We can use that to then enforce security, automate it, um, and have a good visibility into what we have out there and how secure it is. Um, but it takes kind of multiple disciplines working with compliance to actually make that a reality. If you leave non-technical people to go build a policy for how it, things should work in the cloud, you end up with an on-prem policy applied to the cloud that just doesn't work. So this is my plea to technical security people to work with compliance to build the tools, build the policies to make cloud compliance really effective because there's no reason with the amount of automation and the APIs that uh, AWS or Azure gives you, you can't be secure. So what to do? Patterns is my word of the day. Um, you know, build the way that people should use the cloud that best fits your company. Don't just read a blog post and like say, we're gonna do that. But figure out how your company you know, does application development, figure out patterns that work for you and document those and um, you know, push that out. And I think cloud security is not a technical problem. Um, there are plenty of technical problems, but it is really a people and an organizational problem. And you have to think of it very holistically, not as a, I have SQL injection, that's a very specific problem, but I have, how does my whole company access AWS? Um, and I think it's a huge security opportunity, but we have to build something between a prison and a playground where we have you know, enough freedom to, to use the cloud, but not so much that people you know, leave open S3 buckets with tons of data, data scientists. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I think that kind of brings us into just what, if you were to sort of take all this and package it up into something that you could do today, um, what would that look like? Um, the, Andrew said something in one of the earlier talks, he talked about complacent, motivated, inspired. I really like that because it sort of goes right into something that we've worked in, uh, at least as lending and, um, and still in consulting around how we iterate through IAM uh, and securing that and, and making that a, a process that, that becomes automated. Um, there, just to jump into that, uh, your, your traditional process is really around spreadsheets, right? It's like, okay, we're going to set up an export, we're going to send that to the auditor, the auditor is going to be like, all right, cool, this person has these permissions, whatever, and uh, I have to meet a particular policy. Um, talk to your auditors. Um, show them what you can do with automation and start to either leverage infrastructure as code, invest in that upfront resource cost to have that conversation with those, with those folks, and show them that you're trying to make their job easier. Take the time to understand what they're trying to tell you as an auditor and why. Understand the why you know, for yourself and for, um, and, and for your colleagues, and then help them understand why you want to do what you want to do and work together. Uh, because if you don't, you can't, you can't move into this automated fashion because it, at, at the end of the day, you're, you're going to have to work with them. Uh, once you get through that automation and you're starting to, to, to make sure that that all uh, works well, uh, you can make that managed and testable. And this is all to get to the point where if you're looking at uh, permission review or, or access review, you want to be able to make statements uh, to, your, to your auditors. Go to them and wouldn't it be cool to say, hey, auditor guy, you know, all access is controlled via change management and peer review, and you're a part of that change management process, you can approve this. And that's something that we, we were able to do successfully, or add them into the code review. Have development teams you know, participate in that process. Uh, with something like STS roles and AWS organizations, you'll be able to say things like, no one or only a few have people have console access to AWS and all the changes are made via Terraform or cloud formation. And that was something that we were able to achieve with not, not completely, you know, the DevOps teams and still have some of that access, but to be able to do that, that gives the auditor something to review. Or all changes are validated through standard test automation. Tests are fallible, but you can, you know, you can work through that and make sure that these rapidly expanding environments are, are um, are easier to, to manage. And if you can make those statements, that's what they, that's what they want. They want to be able to make truthful statements that uh, attest to the security of the organization. Uh, some key tooling and guidelines or uh, things that we try to do. Uh, code as, as much as you can, but you know, a hero swooping in and telling you how to do things is not always fun. Be a part of the team. Be Bartman, not Batman. 
Um, you know, you want to you want to try to make sure that everything that you're doing is understanding the culture of the team and making sure that you're you're working with them and not uh, on them or against them. Find a champion project. At least it's lending. That was Vault. That was the HSM stuff. Um, use that time, money, effort equation and, and make sure that you're, you're working together. You can use those champion projects to your advantage. You can use compliance to your advantage. You can use your partners to your advantage if you understand why they're trying to get done what they want to get done. And finally, be Doc Brown or the Terminator, whoever your time traveling hero or villain is, um, and think to the future. Use things that you feel like are going to get you to the cloud in four years. Make the, Have that four-year plan. For us, for it was Vault and that HSM, you know, scenario. We knew we couldn't take that into. Um, we knew we couldn't. We couldn't necessarily go fully cloud to secret management and use SSM, but we could use Vault, and that kept us in the data center and the cloud and continued through, um, through the years. So what have we learned? Um, hopefully something, or we just wasted 25 minutes. Uh, <laughs> So cloud security is hard at any scale. So I mean, as consultants, we've worked with you know um, large companies, small companies, and it's it's difficult with you know three EC2s. It's incredibly difficult with thousands. Um, so you have to plan, and this goes back to the strategy. You have to plan early and adapt often. <clears throat> so understand how you're going to use cloud. Decide on what that's going to look like. Communicate that out, and then at every reinvent, completely throw that away and you know redo your plan. Um, but you have to have some kind of plan going into it. You have to communicate that well. You can't just assume that you'll you know, start using AWS and it'll work out and you'll apply some security here and there. Um, security and the strategy have to be kind of aligned. Um, and then be comfortable with the complexity and the risk trade-offs. So it's never going to be simple. Um, you're always going to have a lot of complexity, just like we did on on-prem. Um, but in the cloud, everything is moves way faster. You can spin up a new account. You can spin up apps. You can spin up servers so quickly. Uh, it's going to be complex. And understand those risk trade-offs. Understand where your risk lies with your strategy and your architecture. Um, and understand your compensation controls and be OK with that. So thanks. Thanks. <laughs>I think that what you said is, is, uh, is interesting because it wasn't necessarily, here's what we're going to give you. It was, hey, I have this idea of how I can make this easier for you. How does this, does this will this work, right? And it's having that conversation with that, with that auditor because you, you know, they're used to working with, with whatever they're working with. You have your preferred tools, they're gonna have their preferred tools. If there's something you can integrate with or something that you can make, use to make their lives easier, everyone wants that. As long as you don't come to it as like, I'm going to tell you how to do your job, I think they're going to be receptive. And they, and they were in that case. Uh, with the FIPS stuff, that's harder. <laughs> um, but uh, but it's, it's the same, same kind of thing. And, and I think that with, with the FIPS compliance, it was, I mean, that is, it's a pretty, it was a, it was a hard challenge. I'm happy to, to chat through that later. Cool. Anything else? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Up next, we have...